uh, chapter 5 eukaryotic cells and uh, this is just a concept check uh, if we're talking about eukaryotic cells which we have a little bit we talked a little bit about it before uh, which part is responsible to code from outside the glycocalyx Um, these are basically the organelles inside the eukaryotes. Remember we talked about, uh, in the previous chapter, we talked about the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, right? And we mentioned that the most important of all is that the prokaryotes do not have a well-defined uh, world or, uh, or uh, a nucleus that have a membrane, right? while in, uh, in the eukaryotes it, it is a well-developed nucleus that have a membrane. Uh, on the other hand, the eukaryotes have all these different types of organelles that's within a membrane, uh, most of it within a membrane, while the prokaryotes does not have everything. Okay, so um, this is basically, if you look at it, it just looks like our cells, the cells that, w that we all know, nucleus, uh, nucleolus, endoplasmic reticulum, and so on. We will go through a little bit of details, but it's the same thing that we did in, in, in physiology before, in EMP. So nucleus, obviously, this is in the, uh, the center of the cell. This is the manager of the cell. This is the part that contains the chromosomes, the genetic material, uh, DNA, and so on. Uh, nucleolus is like the nucleus of the nucleus. It's a small uh, uh, organelle within the nucleus. And the function of that, if you still remember from AMP, it's uh, just to, to help us to make ribosomes and ribosomal RNA. Ribosomes and ribosomal RNA. This is a nucleolus. Um, of course, we, you can be asked about this, each one of those. And we will discuss some more details. Uh, endoplasmic reticulum, we talked about this in ANP. There is rough and smooth, if you still remember. The rough ones, endoplasmic reticulum, is the one that have ribosomes on the surface, while the smooth ones does not have ribosomes on the surface. Um, the one that does not have is to make lipids. And in both of them, it's for transport. Golgi apparatus, just like our Golgi apparatus, to package, modify the products, specifically proteins, prior to secretion. If you wanted to secrete something, we called it, in AMP, we call it the finishing deck, if you remember. We, we, li like if this is a factory, you're making anything, right? We're making TVs, for example. We're making laptops. Uh, you don't take it from the machines directly to outside, right? You have to send it to the finishing deck, they take care of it, they uh, make sure that everything looks fine, they paint it, they package it, right? They put it in a good package, and then they export it to the outside. So this is basically the Golgi apparatus. It take it, it pack it, it modify it, and so on. Uh, lysosomes, uh, lyso means lytic, which means to break down or to digest. Soms means bodies. So lysosomes are the bodies for breaking down, which is basically digestion. Digestion of what? Anything. You can digest anything. Any organic material can be broken down in these lysosomes. Uh, vacuoles, this is something that we didn't uh, talk about in, uh, in, uh, in our physiology, in human physiology. Um, vacuoles, or there is something similar to that, but we didn't call it vacuoles. Vacuoles are basically um, cyst that we, s we temporarily store stuff on it uh, so and we transport it on, on those vacuoles uh, it can be a food one that you're storing a food inside it can be water you're storing water and this can be used for uh, regulation of the osmotic pressure so food vacuoles water vacuoles food vacuoles you keep it there until you need it. Water vacuoles are there until you need it, 
whether you need the water or you need to regulate the osmotic pressure, like it's getting too concentrated, get some water from the vacuoles, basically. Uh, mitochondria, just like ours, to make energy, and they have different, uh, different types of uh, cycles. Uh, Krebs cycle, um, um, ATC, or uh, electron transport chain, uh, oxidative phosphorylation, all of this is just like our mitochondria. Uh, chromoplast is another thing that we don't have. In our human cells, we don't have the chromoplast. And not all eukaryotes have it. Only a special type that have the chromoplast because chromoplast is actually in plants. Uh, the photosynthesis, do we know the photosynthesis, right? If it is uh, during light, during sun time, they, they use that energy to produce nutrients or to make nutrients, right? Chromoplast uh, or chloroplast. So they take the sunlight, they take the energy and put it into a chemical energy, like they make starch, for example. If you look about um, any corn, for example, how did they make that corn? Corn is starch, right? They contain starch. How did you make starch? We make it from sunlight. We take that energy and we use it to make starch. So basically, photosynthesis. You're using the light to synthesize the nutrients. Uh, ribosomes, just like ours, protein synthesis. Cytoskeleton, just like ours but it has a different function. So cytoskeleton is just like ours, microfilaments, microtubules, if you remember those. In our cells, it was more for stabilization, for anchoring the organelles, to keep the shape of the cells, right? This is in human cells, but in, in, in other types of eukaryotes that we will talk about, it's different. Beside doing what we just mentioned, it also helped movement. Our cells doesn't move like this, okay? Most of our cells. But this is uh, one of the unique functions. They provide motion. They like contract from this side, they push from this side, changing the shape so they can move. So it is used in movement. So nucleus, Simply the manager of the cells. They contain the DNA, they contain the chromosomes. This is where we direct the protein synthesis. This is the manager. They have the original copies, the DNA, from which you can make RNA, messenger RNA, that leave the nucleus, go to the outside, to the ribosomes, to make protein. Do you remember this? That was all physiology, uh, but generally speaking, the nucleus is the big, the largest organelle in eukaryotes. It's the most prominent, the largest, uh, the manager of all, the director of the cell, you can say it, and it's always uh, surrounded by a double membrane. There are two membranes surrounding it, and there are small pores. These pores are small enough that the DNA cannot leave. DNA is bigger than these pores. That's why if you wanted to make protein, protein synthesis, DNA will not be able to go out and tell the ribosomes what to do. And that's why you make messenger RNA that is uh, single, stranded, small enough to pass through the pores. Inside the nucleus, we mentioned the nucleolus, and what's the function of the nucleolus? RNA and ribosomes. Ribosomal RNA and ribosomes. Both of them start with ribosomes. Ribosomal RNA and ribosomes. We know that the ribosomes are actually in the cytoplasm, right? whether it's free or on the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum. But the question is, where did you make it in the first place? We make it in the nucleolus. This is the assembly site. So if you look at this picture here, you will see a double membrane and small pores. And the nucleolus is inside. 
the function of each organelle is important. At least for mitochondria, let's say, energy, good enough. For, for um, a nucleolus, it is ribosomes and ribosomal RNA, specifically. Um, for the nucleus, it's direct protein synthesis. It's the manager, the director of the cell that contain the original copies, which are the DNA or chromosomes. Next is the endoplasmic reticulum. Obviously, endo means inside. Plasmic means a cytoplasm. Reticulum means a network. So endoplasmic reticulum is a network inside the cells. It can be rough, it can be smooth. Rough if it has the ribosomes on the, t on the surface. And that's why the surface looks rough. Why does it look rough? Ribosomes stuck on the surface make it look rough. And obviously those that are rough because they have ribosomes, and we know that ribosomes is for, what's the function of the ribosomes? Protein synthesis. Protein synthesis. So obviously the rough ones, since they have the ribosomes on surface, they are responsible for protein synthesis. Why don't you just leave it for, for ribosomes? Like the ribosomes are free. There are some ribosomes free in the cytoplasm, and some of them are stuck on a rough in the plasmic reticulum. Why don't you just leave it free? There is a difference. The free ones, they make protein and they release it in the cells. So you use it for the cells. The ones on the endoplasmic reticulum, this is a big network. So it's stuck on the surface. In that case, when you make the protein, it will move within that network until you take it to the outside. So obviously it's different, right? It's different, free ribosomes from those on the surface of the rough ER. Smooth ones are the ones that does not have ribosomes on the surface. And this is basically to make and store lipids. Make and store lipids. Isn't it a different function? Rough, you make proteins and transport proteins. Smooth lipids, you make it and store it. Okay? So if you look at this picture, this is obviously the endoplasmic reticulum, this network, uh, the purple ones. The rough ones are the ones that have the blue on the surface, which is the ribosomes. Um, and obviously in this picture, you're seeing the endoplasmic reticulum, part of it smooth, which is this part here, and the other part is rough, like this, that have the ribosomes on the surface. So the rough ones are the ones that are going to, relate, to, to make the protein, and it's going to move, move within this network, um, moving, 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 and then they leave from this side right here. Then it will go to the next organelle, which is Golgi apparatus. So, that, so this is the difference as I talked about, the free and the, 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 the endoplasmic reticulum uh, pound ones. Uh, how does it move? If you're talking about proteins, it's leaving the endoplasmic, the rough ER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and it is going toward uh, the Golgi apparatus. For what? What's the function of Golgi apparatus? Packaging, it's modify also. Modify and package, and modify and package. Like you give me a laptop, it's not ready for exporting. I have to take it, coat it, modify it. I can, if something is missing, I put it, and then I put it inside packages, and then I can export it, right? So you modify, you don't take it as it is, just put it in the packages. Packaging and modification, you modify it. You make it in, looks like the final product that's ready for exporting. So the question is, the proteins leaving, the Rafi are moving toward the Golgi apparatus. It moves in the form of vesicles. So you put it like inside a membrane, inside a cyst, inside a vesicle, uh, vacuoles, something like vacuoles, and you take it to the Golgi apparatus. So what's the function of Golgi apparatus? Modify, store, and package. Modify, store, and package proteins. 
and it, it consists of different sister knee sister knee is flat sex like like you see in the picture there the uh, the brown the brown and the, or the beige colored it's sex like this folding 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 like this so the vesicles or the vacuoles entered from one side do you have a question I'm sorry? Uh, I, I don't remember exactly what does it say there, but if, if so, that will be it. Okay. I, I, I don't remember exactly what, what does it say in... Uh, in, in uh, you, you're talking about these, the cards? Yeah. Does it mention the Golgi apparatus? I don't think so. Okay. I think it's just uh, mentioning the bacteria, different types of organisms. Oh. One side is organism and the other side is uh, what does it do and the diseases and so on. Oh. So I, I don't think so. I didn't oh. see that at least. Oh, sorry. It's okay. So um, this is a Golgi apparatus. It, form, uh, it consists of cisterny. What's a cisterny? Flat sex. So this is the sequence from the very, very beginning. Nucleus. The nucleus make messenger RNA that goes to the ribosomes. Ribosomes are in the surface, in this case, it's in the surface of the rough ER. It makes proteins. Proteins leave the rough ER, move toward the Golgi apparatus in the form of vesicles or vacuoles. And then Golgi apparatus is going to release vesicles again for secretion. What's the difference between free and membrane bound ribosomes? Both of them to make protein. What's the difference? The free ones make f proteins for? For the cell itself. For your own use. But the ones that on the rough AR is for exporting. Like, if, don't you make l laptops, for example, to use it in here, and some of them are used to export? Right? The ones that, that for own or your own use are these free ones. Okay? Um, so the, 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 the vesicles that come from the uh, rough ER that contain the proteins, you call it transport vesicles, okay? Uh, uh, the, the, the condensing vesicles, on the other hand, these are the ones that take the protein to the organelles or to secretory vesicles which is moving toward the outside. So we have transport vesicles, condensing vesicles, and secretory vesicles. We have three types of vesicles. Transport vesicles, this is between the rough ER and Golgi apparatus, that's it. it just move it from one to the other, transported. Transporting vesicles to transport from the rough ER to the Golgi apparatus, that's it. Condensing vesicles will take it to the organelles. Uh, secretory is for outside, for secretion. Here it is, you see these transport vesicles, the purple ones. Um, these are the purple ones that move from the rough ER to the, um, uh, to the uh, maturing surface of the Golgi apparatus. It enters in inside the Golgi apparatus and it is going to leave the, uh, through the other types of vesicles depending on what are you going to use it for. Lysosomes. Lysosomes. Lyso means lytic, breakdown. Somes means bodies, right? These are the bodies that are used to break down something. Break down means to digest it, right? Uh, so how, to, how do you digest? It contains enzymes. So if you wanted to destroy something, you send it to the lysosomes. The lysosomes are going to secrete enzymes on it that will break it down means digest it, right? So we call that intracellular digestion. Do you only digest food? You can digest food, right? If I wanted to break down this food into smaller particles, it's okay, I can send it to the lysosomes. But what if this is an, organi um, I mean it, an organism or microbe that's invading this eukaryote? The lysosomes can also break it down. The lysosomes, it will break down whatever come to it. 
okay you send them nutrients it will digest these nutrients you send them microbes they will digest the microbes foreign bodies they will digest the foreign bodies right so they don't do not distinguish they just whatever you send them they release enzymes on it you got the idea this is what's happening whatever you send them that's okay they will release enzymes and destroy it uh, vacuoles on the other hand these are another type of sacs uh, that contain particles that is that you're sending it somewhere like you put it within these sacs and you send it somewhere you send it to the lysosomes to be digested maybe you send it uh, to to be excreted outside to leave the cell membrane and go outside yes uh, you just keep it there for some time storage in case if something happened you can use it this is another uh, possibility so vacuoles are, are basically temporary storage temporary storage you store it whether it because you got um, uh, you store it temporarily and then whatever will be your next step you can store it temporarily and then digest it you can store it temporarily and export it outside uh, or you just keep it there until you need it. These are the different types uh, of vacuoles or the different functions of the vacuoles. Um, yes? So what's the difference between vacuoles and vesicles? Uh, not much different, but the vesicles, the, the, the vacuoles uh, are not, most of them are not related to the Golgi apparatus. It's just something inside, like a, a storage inside the cell. The vesicles are related to the Golgi apparatus those that take the protein from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi or take it from the Golgi to the outside or somewhere else so if it is related to the Golgi apparatus these are the vesicles the vacuoles are, are very similar but it's storage you store stuff on it in it vesicles is not basically for storage it's to transport to export and so on okay you're welcome. Uh, these vacuoles, those ones specifically, we said that the vacuoles are temporary storage, right? Temporary storage until you do the next step. What's the next step? I don't know, depend on the cell. You can send it to be digested. You can export it outside. You just can keep it there. You can keep it even for months and, and for a long time. Uh, if, if, the, if the condition is not good for the eukaryote or for the eukaryotic cell, you can keep it there for a long time, right? But those who are responsible for digestion, those that are, will take it to digestion, it will take it obviously to the lysosomes, right? They are going to merge with the lysosomes. We call those the phagosomes. So what are the phagosomes? This is the one type of vacuoles that is for digestion. It goes like this. Okay, here is one type, type, type. You have three different types, right? This one is for digestion. This one is for temporary storage. This one is for exporting. All of these are vacuoles, right? Th this one only, that's responsible for digestion. How does it digest? It moves toward the lysosomes, and then it will open its contents like this. The contents go to the lysosomes, they merge together. And the contents go to the lysosomes, lysosomes are going to throw enzymes on it, breaking it down. You call this one only, special type of vacuole, Phagosomes, okay? Phago means to eat. Phagosomes are the, and eating we mean digestion, right? You eat something, you're going to digest it. So we call those phagosomes. Next is mitochondria, simply ATP, energy. You make and store ATP. Make and store energy. Make and store ATP. This is a mitochondria. Um, uh, chloroplast, I mean chloroplast. Chloroplast is something unique in some eukaryotes. Uh, do we have that in, in humans and animals? We don't. Uh, this is basically in plants, right? But there are some eukaryotes that act like a plant, and we will discuss the details. Those, those ones that act like a plant, they work like a plant, they have that green stack inside that they, that they do not need somebody else to survive. They do not need to be a parasite. They, do not they don't have to invade ourselves or something. They can work on themselves. They just can take that 
they can do uh, take the light and they convert it into chemical energy what do we call this process when you take the light yes photosynthesis so these are the ones that can do photosynthesis and this is in algae and plants okay so plants we all know plants plants have chloroplasts right we all know that that's why plants are always green right at least in the beginning they are green the leaves are green right why is it green because this is the color of the chloroplast it's green in color so this is a plant but the algae is acting like it's not a plant but it acts like a plant in in which aspect photosynthesis ribosomes we have two types as i mentioned free and those who are stuck on the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum making it rough. In both cases, it makes protein. The difference is the free is for what? The free ribosomes make protein for what? For the cell use itself. You use it inside. While the other ones on the, on the, on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, mostly for export. Okay? But both of them, they make uh, proteins anyway. And um, these ribosomes, when we talked about the prokaryotes, remember the prokaryotes also have organelles, right? Not all of this, but they do have some organelles. Uh, these ribosomes, if, the, if you eukaryotes, they do the same function in a, in, in a bacteria, but it's just bigger. If you compare ribosome to ribosome between eukaryotes and bacteria, it's bigger than eukaryotes. Internal structure, this is a framework of proteins, microfilaments, and microtubules, and we talked about this in the beginning. It's just like our cytoskeleton, cyto means cell, skeleton means skeleton, right? Like our skeleton, which is the bone, they have a skeleton inside the cell as well, the skeleton of the cell. These are tiny structures, microfilaments, and microtubules, and in ours, it's to keep the shape, to stabilize the cell, right? And also to transport. Uh, but in other types of eukaryotes, like protozoa, for example, we will talk about those. But the, um, the additional function here will be movement. They can help you to move. Um, which is called the amoeboid mo mo movement or the pseudo pseudopodia. Did we hear about the pseudopodia? So it's like, if, if this is a round structure like this, the cytoskeleton is going to push from this side and push from this side. You start to move and you pull from this side. So it helps you to move around in certain types only. So can you answer this question? Packaging, transporting, Golgi. Okay, now we will go to the specifics. What are the eukaryotes that we need to know? Fungus, algae, protozoa, and parasites. And we will need to know details about each one of those. Fungus, algae, protozoa, and parasites. These are all eukaryotic uh, organisms, microorganisms. So we'll start with the fungus. The fungus is usually unicellular. What's uni means? One cell. One cell. But they can also use uh, live in colonies. Okay, a, a, a group of these that lives together. Um, the fungi can be a one of two groups: macro and micro. What's macro means? Big. The big ones are the ones that we can see with our eyes. I, I think we all saw like the mushroom. So, right? Mushroom and, uh, and um, anything that you can see with your eyes big enough to see, we call that the macroscopic ones. The macroscopic ones. Mushroom, the puff balls, and so on. These are all something that you can see with your eyes. Microscopic ones are the ones that you cannot see with your eyes, but remember something. You can't see this one fungus, but you can see the colony, okay? But I'm not. I'm talking about the fungus itself. 
I, if, I, if you look at one fungus, you can't see it. But if you look at a colony, it's different. Like if you look at a bread, don't you look at the bread and say, this is bad, right? Mm -hmm. this is, but this is microscopic. How? Because this is not one. This is a colony. So we're talking about two different things. Okay? So one to one. One, one fungus and one fungus. Macroscopic, big enough to see. Micro, you can't see. Unless it is in a colony. Uh, the micro ones are the ones that we care about more, not, not the macro, the micro, the microscopic fungi. These are the ones that we uh, are going to discuss in details. These are the ones that are clinically important, okay? Um, so how do we classify the fungi? Uh, it, this is important to remember because each one of the four eukaryotes that we talked about is going to be divided according to something different. Okay, are we following so far? So how do you divide the fungi? Morphology. What's morphology? morphology. Shape. shape. Morphology means shape. Okay, yes. So let's look at with this one fungus. It looks like a long filament. We call it hyphae. If it looks like a long filament, we call it hyphae. Long filament is also called mold. You need to remember this. Long filament or mold. Long filament or mold. We call it hyphae. This is a morphological um, categories. Uh, if it is round or ovoid shaped, we call it yeast. And the yeast will always reproduce asexually. You don't have to have a male and female to produce it. It just part of it will detach part of it it will duplicate itself just like cells so this is the yeast so hyphae looks like long filament or mold mold means long filament okay we call that hyphae what if it is round or, or, or ovoid shaped you call that yeast and does yeast reproduce sexually or asexually asexually okay so hyphae which is the molds the filamentous ones uh, if that in the form of mycelia what's mycelia mycelia means a colony of these it will give you this is exactly what i was talking about this will give you a macroscopic but macroscopic you can see it with your eyes but you're not looking at a fungus i'm looking at a mycelia Mycelia means colony, right? I'm looking at a whole colony. Yes, like lo look at these pictures here. You can see, it, but this is still microscopic. You're seeing a whole colony with different colors, whatever you see it, uh, white, uh, red, green, whatever it is, you're seeing the spores, okay? Like what we see in the bread, for example. Uh, the, the, uh, on the bread, it's actually a very tiny, it's microscopic ones, but you're looking at a colony, mycelia. So if that's the case, each group of mycelia, or each group or each uh, mycelia or each colony can give you a different color depending on the spores that in that colony. Okay, did you get my idea? You're looking at it and you can see it with your eyes. Can I say macroscopic? No, it is not. It is still microscopic. It's still mold. It's still um, a hyphae, but you're seeing a whole colony. Okay. The next type is the yeast, and is the yeast filamentous shaped? No, no it is oh. round or oval or ovoid, like kind of oval. Okay. Um, of course, it is asexual. The way they divide is usually by buds, budding. When you see buds, remember yeast. It's asexual, right? It's asexual anyway. But what kind of asexual? Budding. When you see budding, you're talking about not just fungus, you're talking about yeast. Look at this bud. You just make a protrusion like this, a bud, and this one will separate. Now you have two, right? And each one of those two will make a small bud, and this bud will become bigger and detach. You now have four and so on. So this is how they reproduce buds. When you see bud, 
yeast but yeast uh, because it's eukaryote they have all organelles but the yeast have also a cell wall not all eukaryotes have a cell wall right actually most of the eukaryotes do not have a cell wall right we have a cell membrane do you remember this prokaryotes they do eukaryotes yeast have it the yeast have a cell wall and they have all types of organelles the one that they do not do not have is the locomotor organelles so they, ca they can't move like flagella do you remember these flagella flagella cilia and all that it, they don't have it other than that they have everything else mitochondria and ribosomes and rafi are and smoothie are everything else they have it not locomotor is that clear yeast cannot move remember it uh yeast generally speaking if you're talking about one of those it's bigger than the bacteria uh, there is some types of bacteria uh, I'm sorry not bacteria fungus I mean that can change the shape from yeast to hyphae or hyphae to yeast and you call that dimorphic what's di means two, two. and what's morphic two. shape or form yes so dimorphic means two shapes right it changed from filaments to uh, round structure uh, or yeast or from yeast to filament, from yeast to mold, from mold to yeast. Is that clear? So if that's the case, you call it dimorphic. So uh, what's the difference between yeast, mold, and mushroom? Um, yeast is basically a single-celled fungus uh there is one type that's important for humans and this one is called uh the Sac saccharomyces cerevisiae saccharomyces cerevisiae you know what saccharomyces cerevisiae this is the yeast that we buy in the store you go buy a yeast and you use it like to to make um uh any form of uh, foods or something right we buy the yeast uh, so we're talking about this one Saccharomyces cerevisiae okay they, they use it to make food they use it to make alcohol it's a yeast okay and even in, in the store it's called yeast right uh, mold on the other hand uh, they grow in hyphae and and if you look at this picture here looks like this and mold is basically uh, the one that is bad like it, when you buy a house don't they tell you like look for molds do you remember this like it can come like in the woods in the basement something like that right it grow in spots that you hate to see these are mostly the molds will be like this unlike the yeast the yeast is beneficial right we use the yeast alcohol uh, bread right ne uh, food in general it's used yeast the molds when you see it it's usually something bad and it looks like this if you ever see something like that before inspecting a house or something you see lump something like this this is the mold a uh, mushroom on the other hand this is the shape that you can see here which is something that that looks like this the classic one that's that we sometimes see um, in the backyard or something it looks like this nutrition nutrition all fungi are heterotrophic what's hetero means huh different yes what's trophic means feed it's more of a feeding feeding or, or how they eat okay heterotrophic means they feed on something else they do not feed themselves meaning right so obviously do they have chloroplast of course not. if they have chloroplast they will not be heterotrophic all fungi are heterotrophic no exception they do not have chloroplast okay they do not have chloroplast 
So they cannot live by themselves. It's not homotrophic. Did you get the idea? It's heterotrophic. So they need to live on something else. Not necessarily in our bodies or animal bodies. They can live on anything, even dead plants or something which is not bad, right? It's not harmful. So the majority of these uh, fungi are, are harmless. Uh, some of them are harmful. The harmless ones are the ones that are actually beneficial. It's harmless and sometimes it's even beneficial. Like saprobes. Saprobes is the name of the fungus that's responsible for decomposition. Do you remember decomposition? When something is there, dead plants, dead animals, and then they de decompose, right? Disappear, basically. It doesn't really disappear, it's just decomposed. And it mixed with uh, uh, soil and so on. And, and it looks like it's disappearing, it's not. It's just decomposing. And what do you call these harmless fungus? Saprobes. Okay? Saprobes. So what's saprobes? Harmless. Fungus that does decomposition. Is that clear? Harmless decomposing fungus. Saprobes. On the other hand, there are other types that are harmful. Harmful ones are the ones that live on something that is uh, living tissues, living tissues, uh, human tissues, animal tissues, right? So this is obviously a parasitic, right? A parasitic. So did you get the idea? If they live on dead, not living, dead, whether it's plant or, a or, or dead animals, dead anyway, not living, dead. We call that harmless and saccharobes. If they live on living tissues, human tissues, animal tissues, we call that parasites. Did you get the difference between those two? Okay. Um, when, when these types of fungus, which is parasites, when, when they cause disease, whether it is in animals or humans, we call that mycosis. So like uh, if you have, uh, do you, we know the athletic uh, uh, foot, right? Athletic feet, isn't that a fungal infection? We call that infection mycosis. Where did you get that word from? Mycos is another name for fungus. Mycos is another name for fungus. So mycosis is you're being invaded by fungus, which is a fungal infection, okay? So what do you call it if an animal or a human is infected by fungus? My Mycosis, mycosis. So if you look at this, this is athlete's foot. See how it looks like? Um, wh what's the organism calling, causing this? It, it's mycos, yes, but which type? Does anybody remember? Tinea. Yes, tinea. So it's tinea. I'm, I'm just asking. Uh, most likely, we, we forget, of course. But just if you remember. Um, and and if, if you think about athlete, athlete or athlete's foot, why that? Why did you call it athlete foot? Yes. Because those athletes, they work for, or they, they play for a long time, <laughs> they, do, they, they have a lot of sweat, so this humid environment is very encouraging to this type of fungus. Okay? So fungi, rural fungi, it can be beneficial and it can be bad, right? Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Not all of them are bad. Uh, the beneficial or, or the, the beneficial one is decomposers. This is something good. There is no need to keep dead uh, animal bodies, right? Or dead plants. What the need for? Actually, when these decomposers, which is called 
What do you call these decomposers? Saprobes. Saprobes. Remember this. Saprobes. Saprobes. So these saprobes, which is decomposers, this is actually something good. Because when they decompose uh, the, uh, the dead animals and the dead plants, they enri enrich the soil, right? So the soil will be better. Whether we're talking about better for uh, other plants to use these nutrients or to enrich the, uh, the soil, um, oil, it can make it in uh, millions of years and so on. Uh, the, others, the other thing that's beneficial is, besides the, the decomposers, is they can use it to produce antibiotics. They, they take it in the lab and they do some work, uh, they invade them with something until they get the antibiotics and they use it. Others are for nutrients, they can use it for alcohol, for bread, for they make organic acids, they make uh, vitamins out of it. They, there, are, there are a lot of benef benefits from fungus besides the genetic studies. So these are all the beneficial ones. The bad ones is that they can infect us, right? What do you call it when they affect humans or animals? My, mycosis, yes, mycosis. And, uh, and the other thing that's bad, they do not even have to invade us. Uh, sometimes we can have allergy against fungus. Just like, you know, some people can have allergy against peanuts, for example, right? Some people have allergy against the certain types of fungus. W whenever it's available in the environment, you just smell it and you get that start to cough and sneeze and you have these reactions. This is allergy. And some of them are even produce toxins. They are toxic. Of course, all of this is bad. The other thing is they can invade our plants, the crops, the food storage, right? Like the moldy rye. Uh, the, the, uh, they are storing the corn and then you, you look at it and you see this fungus on it, you throw it away, right? Isn't that bad? This is the bad part. Adverse impact. So all of these. Invading us, mycosis. We produce allergy toward these, it's allergic reaction. Some of them produce toxins. Some of them invades our crops and food storage. Okay? Mycosis, if we're talking about mycosis specifically, which is infe fungal infection of humans, right? The vast majority of the fungus is superficial. This is what we hear about all the time, right? Athlete's food, foot, uh, you have something on your body from out, it's always on the skin, right? This is the superficial form, which is the vast majority. We call it superficial. They do not invade, which is this is what we actually uh, familiar with. This is what we can usually see, which is superficial, uh, like it can be on the outer epiderms only, like uh, tinea versicolor, for example. Uh, it can be epiderms, and but invade some of the derms and hair, uh, like tinea. So tinea does not only involve the epiderms; it goes a little bit more. It goes to the derms and uh, to the hair. Okay, like tinea, we talked about this. Uh, rainworm, athlete's foods, all of this. Um, uh, this is, it's still superficial, but not only epiderms. Tinea versicolor is only epiderms. Uh, some of them uh, invade even to the mucous membranes. Candidiasis is the most common one that we need to remember. Candida albicans. What albicans mean? White, yes. White. Candida albicans, why did you call it this? It's candida, this is the name of the, of the fungus. And albicans because if you are invaded with those, you will see the inside of the cheeks that's looking white and, and some spots are red, white and red. So if you look at, if, if, if this patient, you open, open the mouth wide and you look inside and you see the mucus, mucus is the inside of the cheeks, right? So if you look at the inside of the cheeks, the mucus, and you see white patches like this, and you see some red on it, this is definitely candida, candidiasis. He's in, or he or she are invaded with the candida, okay? Uh, of course, they do not take it like this. Not like, uh, open your mouth, you have candida. They take a swab, they look under the microscope, and guess what? They have a unicellular organism there, they look at it, it has a nucleus, looks like eukaryotes, right? It might be 
uh, dividing asexual and so on. We look at it under the microscope to know exactly what it is. Okay? On the other hand, there is systemic ones. Systemic means it goes inside to the systems, not just the skin. Okay? Uh, like lung is the most common one. They can invade the lung. Uh, they can also invade the lung and the skin at the same time. Uh, let me say this. Um, if, if it, lung and skin, this is also kind of common a little bit. Like histoplasmosis, for example. Histoplasmosis. Uh, Cryptococcosis, another example. Uh, Cocodomyces, uh, plastomycosis, these diseases. Histoplasmosis, let me take it as an example. I mentioned that usually the fungus is superficial, right? 90% of the time, if you have a fungus, I can tell you it's invading your skin or mucous membrane, right? And this is superficial. It does not invade systemically. It doesn't go to the system, except these kind of exceptions. Histoplasmosis, for example, this is more common in states like Arizona, where it have a lot of dust, right? So it can be like in the dust and you're breathing that, it go to your lung and invades you, okay? Um, uh, how can it invade you if you are healthy? And it's usually invade the skin. This is an exception. Some of them, just you inhale them. And this is, again, it's not widespread. Uh, if it is, if you are invaded with a different type that goes inside, but not like this. This is, it, it goes inside your lung just because you're breathing it, right? It finds a route. But how can it go like to your blood and to the organs inside? If that's the case, you are immunocompromised. Okay? So if you are healthy, let's say it like this. You have a fungal infection. Are you healthy or immunocompromised? If you're healthy, it's usually superficial, which is the skin or mucous membrane. Okay? Or occasionally it can be the lung like histoplasmosis. Alright so far? If you are not healthy, if you, if you are immunocompromised, it can cause systemic. So it's not it completely not normal to see a healthy person with systemic mycosis. Is that clear? The only exception is this one because you breathe it, which is something like histoblasmosis. Um, how to identify fungus? I mentioned that you see a patient open your mouth, you see white patch and some red areas and you say to yourself, okay, this looks like candida, right? Candidiasis, candida albicans. Uh, this is not enough to look at it. You need to take a swab and put it in a specific media. We call that isolation, inoculation in the media. And then you look at structures that are asexual spore forming. Look under the microscope, they make spores, okay? Uh, the, if it is hyphae, what kind of hyphae? Uh, if it makes colony, uh, what kind of pigment? Is it making a green, uh, yellow, red pigment? Depending on that uh, pigment color. Physiological characteristics. How do they, uh, they can study everything about them. You can even do genetic map uh, makeup. If, if that, that's the most advanced. Like if you do, it, if you study the genes, you know for sure what it is. But you can tell even without the genetic makeup with, the, with all of these. Let me see what type of high feed you have. Uh, let me see the spores, the, the, the spores that are asexual, uh, how the colony looks like. You can tell from these. But the most advanced is Genes, genetics. If you look at the genetics, you can tell. Uh, so can you tell me which of these can be used for classification that we just mentioned? B and C, which is E, right? Okay. So this was the fungus. We're done with the fungus, okay? Any questions about the fungus? We're good so far. Okay. So the next eukaryote is protists. Protists are organisms that 
they put it in a separate category because they do not fit anything else, basically. It's not animal. It's not plant. It's not fungus. What else is it? We just put it together and we call them protest. Okay? And protest can be one out of the following. Can be algae or protozoa. Algae and protozoa, it's not a fungus, but it's not a plant or animal. What else? We call it protest. Okay? Are we good so far? Okay, so obviously both algae and protozoa, both of these are eukaryotic organisms. Okay? Usually it's unicellular, sometimes it's colonial, colony, but they are unicellular. The algae is a protest that's closer to plants. Protozoa is a protest that's closer to animals. Okay? It's not a plant, it's not an animal. Are we clear? We put it in a separate category because it's not a plant, it's not an animal. And it's not even a fungus. It's a protest, right? But what kind of protest? If it is closer to the plants, it's not a plant, but closer to the plant, in which way? Chlorophyll. They have chloroplast, right? Chlorophyll. So they can do photosynthesis, right? So it's unicellular most of the time, sometimes colonies, but most of the time unicellular. And they can do photosynthesis. You call that algae. So is that algae homotropic or heterotropic? Homotropic, right? The algae is homotropic. Uh, if you leave it alone without anything else, can it survive? Of course, yes. They can just sunlight, convert it, use it, and that's it. Photosynthesis. If you can do photosynthesis, you can live on your own, which is called the homotropes. Protozoa, on the other hand, is also unicellular, and they have a lot of similarities, uh, but it's closer to animals. Okay? And obviously, these are heterotrophs. So algae, most of them are free-living, in fresh and marine water, like planktons, we call it planktons. Uh, not only that they feed themselves, but they are actually making food with to other aquatic habitants, something like uh, fish. They can feed on those, okay, or any other organisms, any other. Um, habitats in the, in the water, they can use these algae as a source. Just like humans, we use plants, right? Plants are homotrophs, right? They have chloroplasts. They can live on their own, and we use them. Algae do the same rule, but in the water, okay? This is the food or, or the, um, the food web in the water. Uh, we also use it to make agar. Do you remember the agar? The algae is used for red algae is used for agar. Uh, also, just like plants, they take carbon dioxide. They, 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 you guys did biology before, right? You, they take carbon dioxide, they take the sunlight, they put them together with water, and this is how they make nutrients, right? Carbon dioxide, water, and uh, energy from sunlight, right? This is how they make. So basically, they are getting rid of carbon dioxide, and they give us oxygen. So this is the source of atmospheric oxygen. Not the only source. Plants is the major source, right? But these also provide some source. Um, if you look at this picture right here, sometimes you see this red hides on the surface of the water. This is called dinoflagellates. Looks like this picture here. So remember this name. If you see the red tides, Look at the water and you see it getting reddish. You see tides that are getting reddish. And you're wondering what is this? Um, this is a type of um, uh, a protest that's called algae. And it's which algae specifically? Dinoflagellates. We're not going deeper in the algae, but this type is important to remember. Dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates like this, which you're seeing there. And this is basically, they give that red uh, tide look to the, to the water. And if that's the case, you're not supposed to go closer to that water. Okay? If you see the red tide, stay away. Why? Because they produce toxins. And this toxin can make neurological symptoms. So if you go swimming in these 
when you see the red tide, stay away. If you go there, you can get poisoned, you can get these toxins, and they bad enough that they can uh, do like neurological symptoms. They invade, uh, the toxins can uh, be harmful to our nervous system. So this is the algae. See it's green because they have the chloroplast or the chlorophyll. This is the algae cells itself. Next is the protozoa. Protozoa do not have a cell wall. Do not have a cell wall. Okay? Usually unicellular. Most of the, the protozoa, just like the fungus, are harmless. Does the fungus have a cell wall? The fungus does have a cell wall. Protozoa does not. Okay? Protozoa does not have a cell wall. Most of these are harmless. If it is harmful, you call it parasite. Just like the fungus, right? Parasite. If it is harm harmful, we call it parasite. Uh, like those uh, that can, can, can invade us through an insect vector. Like malaria, for example. Do we know malaria? What does it, how does it come to us? Mosquitoes, right? Mosquitoes. So, um, which is an insect, mosquito, and, and, and it lives in the mosquito, and uh, it can get into our blood. Malaria is an example of parasitic one. All of these protozoa are heterotrophic. Heterotrophic. Does they have chloroplast or chlorophyll? They do not have chloroplast or chlorophyll. So they have to be heterotrophic. Are the algae heterotroph or ho homotroph? Oh. Homo. The algae, they can live. They have their chlorophyll. Their cytoplasm, which is different than other types of uh, eukaryotes, uh, it's actually ecto and endo. What's ecto mean? Outside. Outside, yes. And endo, inside. So it's two components. And instead of just being a cytoplasm, just like this, it's part of it is outside and part of it is inside. It's like two components. Um, they engulf microbes or organic matters. They engulf it, they eat it, and this is how they get their food. Obviously, they cannot live on their own, right? It's heterotroph. So they, whatever they can eat, they eat it. Whether it's something organic material, organic matter, or microbes, whatever it is. Protozoa usually have locomotor structures. Locomotor structures. Uh, remember the, the, the fungus, the yeast, does not have a locomotor structure. Remember we said all organelles except locomotor. Protozoa, they do have the locomotor structures. Whether we're talking about flagella or cilia or sauropods, they have something to help them to move, most of them, okay? Are we okay so far? Uh, they exist in different forms. There are two forms that we need to remember specifically. And these, the two forms that we always see, which is either the trophozoate or sporozoate. What does that mean? Trophy coming from trophic. These are the ones that are the vegetative form. These are the ones that can eat, okay? These are the motile ones. The vegetative ones. These are the ones that actually moves and eats. Trophozoite. Uh, sporozoite means it, they, they live temporarily. Temporarily. In the form of spores. Do you remember the spores? When they get smaller, shrink, and have vacuoles of food, and they have a lot of layers to protect them, right? So sometimes if um, the condition is unfavorable, like they don't have see nutrients, it's getting too cold, too hot, something like that. It's not favorable anyway. Uh, if that's the case, they become dormant. Is that vegetative? Sporozoid is not vegetative, it's a spore form. Spore form is like this. They shrink, they acquire more cell wall and stay like this, don't do anything. Until 
the condition improve and then they return back to the trophozoite. Did you get the, the difference? Trophozoite versus por sporozoite. Vegetative versus spores. Dormant. Trophos means trophic. These are the vegetative form. These are the ones that actually survive, they live, they move, they eat. The vegetative form, trophos. Trophic means to, to feed. Uh, sporozoite is spores. Spores are dormant, okay? They don't do anything, just stay until it gets better. So if you look at this picture here, here's the trophozoite, acquire a wall, they become mature, they stay. If condition gets better, they change and become trophozoite, okay? Uh, the way we classify protozoa, do you remember how did you classify fungus? Morphology and asexual reproduction, right? This classify uh, uh, the protozoa are classified uh, according to locomotion. How do we, uh, how do you move? Are you using flagella? Are you producing pseudopods? Are you using cilia? Or are you non-motile completely? You do not move. Most of them they do, okay? But some of them do not move. So um, we said that a lot of protozoa are not pathogenic, right? They are not harmful. Uh, let's talk about the harmful ones, the one that can actually cause disease, that can invade us. We call those pathogenic, okay, pathogenic. The first type that used flagella, example, trypanosoma. Trypanosoma is an example of these that use flagella, okay. Um, trypanosoma, uh, brucei versus cruzii or cruzi. Uh, Brucei is the one that call that cause sleeping sickness, African sleeping sickness. Uh, uh, the 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 cruzy one is the one that call that that, that uh, cause Chagas disease. They call it the kissing disease. Obviously, uh, uh, it it moves through or, or uh, in, uh, infects through kissing. Uh, the sleeping sickness they found it. It's more in Africa, it, but it can be in any hot environment. Uh, and when somebody's invaded with, with, with this type of um, protozoa, which is troponosoma, they are sleeping all the time. Like they go to the doctor sleeping 15 hours a day or something, and they, they start to have like something in their skin and they look different, but the, the main thing is they are sleeping the whole time. And then they get a sample from their blood and they look until they found that troponosoma, okay? Uh, trypanosoma is transmitted by blood sucking vectors, uh, insect or, or something like that, it, whatever, any type of insect, whatever uh, vectors that can suck blood, okay? They can take it from one person, they suck the blood from one person, including these trypanosoma, and then they go inoculate that in another person's blood, so this is how it's transmitted. Are we okay so far? And how do they move? They use flagella. Flagella. Trypanosoma use flagella. And they're transmitted by blood sucking vectors. Trypanosoma. Clear? Trypanosoma. They use the they move by flagella. Transmitted by blood sucking vectors. Whatever the vector is. Next time. Remember that we're classifying according to what? The way they move, which is locomotion, right? The way they move. The first type moved by flagella, which is trypanosoma. How do they invade or how do you get infected? Blood sucking vector. A vector that sucks blood from you and give it to somebody else. Clear? This is what we need to know about trypanosoma. 
Second type, it used pseudopodia. Or they call it, they have the amoebic, amoebic type of motion. They do not have a flagella, they do not have a cilia or anything. It's their own bodies. They don't have appendages. Their own body changed the shape to make something looks like feet, and we call it pseudopodia. What pseudo means? Fake or false. Yes. So they have the fake or false feet, and that's why they call it pseudopodia. So if you're using pseudopodia, what do we call this movement? Amoebic or amoeboid movement. Amoeba-like movement. Intamoeba. Intamoeba hostilorica. So intamoeba, like intamoeba hostilorica, for example, they, they move around like this. Let's say this is the intamoeba, something like this. They start to move and they, they do something like this, okay? Start to extend. So it looks like a feet and start to like move around. And they change the shape and they move like this. If you want to move this way, you make the feet this way and so on. Okay, so they use pseudopodia and we call this amoeboid movement. When you use the pseudopodia, we call it amoeboid movement. Okay? How do you get into amoeba hostilorica? You get it by ingesting cysts. Okay, uh, this is the one thing that if you go like overseas or something, they tell you, uh, do not drink from any water, right? You have to get bottles or something like that. Otherwise, you will get the amoeba. This is what they're talking about. Okay, they advise you. If you go there, drink from bottled water, right? Do not drink from any other sources of water or uh, any other juice or something like that. Try to avoid that. They are feeling this. Because sometimes uh, the cyst will be in a food or drink or something and you ingest it. And it goes to your small intestine specifically. Is that okay? So how do we get, into, let's say from the beginning, we are dividing them according to their locomotion or movement, right? This type use the intamoeba, use what? Sodopodia. They use sodopodia to move, okay? What else do we need to know about this infective amoeba, which is Intamoeba hastelorica? Beside moving, beside, beside using the pseudopodia, and what do you call it if you're using pseudopodia? Amoeboid movement. Amoeboid movement, okay? So if they're using this pseudopodia, what else do we need to know about them? How can we get infected with those? Cysts in food or drink. You're drinking or eating something that has the cysts. It's not clean enough. <coughs> Sometimes you get it even in the food, like salad or something, like this person didn't wash his hands uh, before um, uh, cooking or before uh, preparing salad or something, so he have these cysts. And you eat the salad or drink water that have the cysts, it go to your small intestine, it hatches, the cyst will hatch, and the entamoeba itself is going to invade your intestine. In the beginning, uh, this is extra, you don't have to know it, but they call, they call something called amoebic dysentery. Like, uh, sometimes we hear it a lot, like somebody's coming from overseas and say, um, I, I have like some troubles in my stomach, I, I, when I go to the bathroom, um, I can't make it, it's like constipation, but not really constipation, like a diarrhea or constipation, you see, it's something like this. This is amoebic dysentery, and this is still in the beginning. If this person is weak enough, they are going to invade other organs, okay? Most of the time they do not. But um, they can invade other, like liver and lung, if this person is very weak. Uh, next type is called, and again, we're talking about how they move, right? Uh, they have, the, the next type that move using cilia, cilia. They have cilia, which is hair-like structures, and this is how they move. And the example of that is Plantigium coli. This is something that lives in the coolant, and this is where the name came, get, came from, Plantigium coli. And just remember that it moves by cilia. Okay? Uh, next type does not move. They do not have any of those. No cilia, no flagella, no pseudopodia. Um, an example of that is uh, sporozoa. 
like plasmodium, plasmodium species. You do not have any of those. They just move with the bloodstream, okay? And the best example of that is plasmodium that cause malaria, okay? Plasmodium uh, vivax or whatever the, the plasmodium is. Plasmodium is a species, by the way. So what's the spo plasmodium? This is a sporozoa that does not have any mean of movement, okay? We call that pl plasmodium. Plasmodium what? Different species. We're not getting into the details now. Just know for, for ge generally speaking, it's a plasmodium sporozoa does not have a mean of movement. Clear? Like malaria. If you ask yourself how malaria moves, it just moves the bloodstream. Okay? You do not have their own needs. Uh, last one that also, also used the flagella is Gyargia lambia. Uh, they have a whip like structure. Look at these. They have these long flagella. They use it that like, looks like a whip uh, like structures. And this is how they move. It also invades the intestine. So which types use flagella? Trypanosoma and Gyargia. Both of them use flagella. It's different, but they use flagella anyway. Which one does not move? That does not have a mean of movement? Plasmodium. Which one use the cilia? Plantigium. Plantigium coli. Plantigium coli. And which one use the pseudopodia? The amoeba or the entamoeba histologica, uh, as an example. Uh, which which of those? Algae and protozoa. Always? Is it always? We didn't say always, right? Mo it's mostly. Are both of them photosynthetic? Which one is photosynthetic? Algae only, so this is not right. Uh, both of them have mitochondria? Yeah. All, every single organism have mitochondria. All these eukaryotes have mitochondria. So yeah, that's true. Is both of them heterotroph? Mm -hmm. Which one is heterotroph? Protozoa, right? So by exclusion, and it's not, not by exclusion. Uh, we know that all eukaryotes have mitochondria anyway, right? Yeah. This is where they make the ATP. Okay. Next type is Helminthes. Helminthes means worms. Okay? So paras parasitic Helminthes are the worms that invade us. They are parasitic. Obviously, this is never unicellular. It's a whole worm, right? So it's multicellular. And they have organ systems. We have reproductive system, digestive system, skeletal system, and so on. Uh, the, uh, some of these are parasitic, which is what we're talking about. The parasitic ones are the ones that, that have a host, they live in a host tissue. Okay? Are we following so far? These parasites, they have a mouth part to help them to attach to the digestive system, which is called scolex. Are we following? They have to have it. Otherwise, if they don't have it, they go to our intestine and they go in a feces, which is which it doesn't happen actually, right? If you ask yourself, like you're ingesting something with these worms, okay, you ingest it, it leaves. No, it doesn't happen because of scolex. What's a scolex? Mouth part for attachment. For attachment, it goes like this. You have a mouth like this, with some, you have something that looks like teeth, okay? And they go to the intestine and they attach themselves. And that's why it, it doesn't leave. It goes in and it doesn't leave. They, they are uh, using the scholars. They have well-developed sex organs. So this is not a sexual reproduction, right? This is a sexual reproduction. This is sexual reproduction. Uh, they produce eggs and sperms which is used for, for uh, reproduction, okay? So there is male and female, right? Worms have male and female, okay? 
the, the, the male produce sperm, the female, just like animals, humans, and humans, right? Are we following so far? Okay, so they do produce eggs and sperms. There are male or females. However, however, there are some types of worms that's called hermaphrodite. What's hermaphrodite? Both of them. They are male and female at the same time. They produce sperm and eggs. They fertilize itself. So we call that hermaphrodite. When they produce the egg and the egg is fertilized, so the sperm came to the egg, it become fertilized, now it will become larva. Okay? Uh, so these eggs that will become larva, this is how they get in and out of the host. They get into the host like an egg or larva and they leave in that same form. Okay? Some of them will invade you by being an egg, fertilized egg, some of them will, will, will get to you being a larva and they live in the form of eggs, okay? Uh, so they, they alternate the development between larva and eggs. Eggs become larva. When the eggs hatch, it become larva. And the, most of the time they have alternate host. What's alternate host? Like if they invade us, humans, they invade something else also. Okay, like, um, like the fluke worms, Bilharziasis. They invade us, okay? When they leave our body through urine or feces, it goes into the water and they live in another host. And this host is snails, for example. Isn't that another host? So you usually have more than one host. They stay in the snails for some time, they leave the snails, go to the water, invade us again. So we are hosts, snails are another host. Okay? So the alternate host. So these are different types of helminthes, but we have some details. But look at this. Look at this one here. What is this? This is a scolex, which is a mouth part for attachment. Otherwise, it, will, it cannot infect us, right? How can it infect? They infect because of this. Um, we have different types of parasitic helminthes depending on how do they look like. Is it flat? If they look like flat, meaning they do not have cavity, just flat, we call that the flat worms. If it is not flat and they do have a cavity, it will be the round worms, which is common. Okay? Flat worms. They do not have a well-defined digestive system, these flatworms, because why? They are flat. They don't have cavity. They cannot have a well-defined digestive system. They have a blind-ended pouch. That's it. Just a pouch that blind-ended. Something come in and out. Okay? Uh, they just have a simple ex excretory and nervous system. Just a little bit of those. Uh, what are the types of flatworms that we need to know? Tapeworm is one thing, flukes or fluke worms are another thing. So what's up the, the flatworms? Flatworms are worms that are flat. What do you mean by flat? They do not have a cavity. So what? So they do not have a well-defined digestive system. Okay, so far? They have blind end. This is subdivided, the flatworms, subtypes are tapeworms and flukes. Um, tape worms looks like tape, looks like tape, basically. And you call it cystodes. You need to remember both names. Tape worms are called cystodes. Flukes are called trematodes. You need to remember this. Okay? Tape worms, cystodes. Flukes, trematodes. Okay? So the tape worms or cystodes, this is long flat, and they, they form of repeated segments of something called proglottidus, which is this, okay? It's a series of these parts, proglottidus, 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 one after one after one after one, okay? These are the components, these are the segments. 
they do not have a digestive system and these tapeworms usually come from undercooked meat okay uh, basically they live in the intestine of vertebrates we know the vertebrates right anything that have a vertebra vertebral column uh, animals basically animals that have vertebra uh, and how do we get infected we get these animals we eat the meat that's not some of us uh, like to eat the meat that's that's not well done right kind of raw a little bit or half uh, it doesn't mean that if you eat it like this you get infected but you have a chance right if this animal was infected undercooked meat and they live in the intestine basically flukes which is the trematode so this is the first one okay this the tapeworm or that system the second form which is this Are flukes or trematodes? Um, uh, trematodes. They are also flat but not segmented. They have a sucking mouth part. Okay. So which one is segmented? The tapeworm. The cystod is segmented. And what do you call these segments? Proglottidus. Proglottidus. These are the segments. Flukeworms are not segmented. It's just one piece. Okay. And they have this mouth part. Um, the other type that's not flat. So the first one, the first one is flatworms. Flat. Whether it is a tapeworm, cystode, or flukes, trematode. Okay, so far. What if it's not flat? It's round. We call it nematode. You need to remember both names. Round is called nematode. Um, so this is round obviously and because they are round it means they have a cavity since they have a cavity they have a complete digestive system right um, this is usually found in the digestive system or in the blood and this is how it looks like round Um, how to identify the different helminths? Well, it depends on the stage. Are we talking about eggs, larva, or a whole worm, right? We have different forms. Egg, larva, worm. Egg, larva, worm, right? Egg become larva, larva grow and become worm, right? Egg hatches into larva. Larva grow, become mature, which is the mature uh, worm, right? Um, if it is an actual worm, or even if it is a larva or egg, uh, look at the shape. Obviously, they look different, right? Does it, is it round? Is it flat? Is it segmented? Is it not segmented? Size? Is it big ones? Uh, small ones? Organs? Like round, have digestive, right? A complete digestive system. The, the, uh, the flat worms does not have it. Uh, do they have hooks and suckers or not? So you can classify according to that. Uh, how do they reproduce? Is it um, hermaphrodite? Is it male and female? So use all these characteristics and host when they invade us. Do they go to the intestine? Do they go to the blood? Do they go to the uh, muscles or what? Okay. And how do the eggs or larva? If you're talking about the eggs or larva, how do they look like? So if it is worm, how does it look like? Larva, how does it look like? There are different species. The, um, uh, of worms or parasites, there are a lot of species, a lot of different types. Uh, some of them are all over the world, just distributed. And some of them have geographic, uh, uh, geographic distribution in certain uh, areas only. Uh, you usually you get infected either by the eggs or the larva. Okay, you can get it in the food. Uh, you can get it in the soil. You can get it in the water. You can get it from a vector, uh, insect vector, but never through air. 
Did you ever see a worm like flying in the air or something? Never in the air, right? It can be in the water, you drink, not necessarily you drink, by the way. Uh, schistosomiasis, for example, schistosomiasis, which is called the herziasis. The way they infect us is you go to that stagnant water, you put your feet in or your hand in, and this larva have a very thin uh, mouth and it's very small. They penetrate the skin and go inside until they reach the intestine or the blood. Okay? Uh, so water not necessarily um, uh, drinking. It can invade, you put your feet in the water, it invades your skin. It's still water, right? So they live in the water, they live in the soil, uh, they live in like in the, in the muscles or the intestine of animals. So you get it through food, water, soil, or a vector, never air. Okay? This is their life cycle. Egg, larva, worm. Egg, larva, worm. Uh, if you look at this picture there, male and female, they produce egg, the egg become larva, and it can be transported or it can infect in different ways. You can infect yourself. And we call that auto-inoculation or auto-infection. Auto means self, right? You infect yourself. Uh, most of these worms, like this is the pinworm, okay? Why did you call it the pinworm? Because it literally looks like a pin, okay? Very thin, you know how the pin looks like? Looks like pin. Very tiny ones. Uh, so the life cycle will come, you have a male and female, they lay eggs, right? The eggs will hatch and become larva. And you either also inoculate yourself. Uh, some people, uh, we said that these live in the intestine, right? They live in the intestine. So uh, pinworms specifically, look at this picture, they did it like this for a reason. These kids, specifically in kids, because kids eat anything, right? They eat or drink anything. So in kids, here is a kid, here is, here is a child, who's saying the following, okay? And I've heard that a lot. They say, uh, I'm fine all day long, but I wake up in the night time and I scratch this buttocks around the anus. This, this scratch, scratch, very bad. It's, it's, it's really bad that they have to um, do this and, and, then, uh, and then it disappears. What's happening is, these pinworms, they live in the intestine, okay? They have the, this habit that they leave and go outside through the anus and go around and they start to uh, use their um, tip in the skin and they produce this painful, uh, itchy, so that's why they wake up like it's bad, the itch. We know exactly once when you hear this, it's a pinworm immediately. There's nothing else that does this, this very characteristic kind of, uh, of infection. Wake up in the, in the night time, scratching around this area in the anus, what it is, it's a pinworm immediately, okay? They leave at night time specifically, they start to pin, they start to uh, make these uh, uh, sucking blood and, and they uh, start to, lead to, to do these um, uh, forms and then they leave and go back. They stay for, for some time and then they go back. This is their complaint. So sometimes people like scratch in this area and then they do not wash and then they eat it again. This is called auto inoculation or auto infection, okay? Or sometimes again the same thing, you're scratching and you didn't wash and you're touching somebody else and you invade somebody else. And this is called cross infection. Auto infection you infect yourself, cross infection you infect somebody else, okay? Uh, can you tell me which one of those is true? C. Okay. And that's it for this chapter.